Well, um, I thought I'd start today by giving an introduction about, um, well, probably uh, reminding uh, what are these intrinsically disordered proteins. And I'll give a little history of intrinsically disordered proteins um, and mention what they are. Maybe 20 or 30 years ago, no one knew what they were. And I'll mention how some of these intrinsically disordered proteins can form liquid phases or amyloids. Um, and then I'm going to um, talk more about the results of proteins related to um, ALS. Uh, first, I'll mention FUS TLS, which is, a, I would say, a simpler model for protein aggregation. And then I'll focus on TDP43, whose C-terminal intrinsically disordered uh, region can form harmful aggregates that are involved in ALS. And we want to answer the question of what is the structure of these aggregates and how do they form? Uh, we also have found in recent years, with results uh, obtained here in uh, Trieste, that the N-terminal domain is essential for the physiological activity, but also for the pathological aggregation. And we want to address these questions. What is its structure? And how does it contribute to physiology and pathology? And finally, I'll, um, I'd like to make a few suggestions for future research. Uh, am I going too fast? Fine. OK. Well, that's OK. So um, let me remind you uh, a little bit about what an intrinsically disordered protein is. Um, we all know that well-folded proteins have a discrete conformation that helps them perform their job. Uh, intrinsically disordered proteins are floppy like uh, spaghetti that's been cooked too long. Okay, <laughs> they're very floppy, very flexible, but they may have a small region with structure, like maybe an alpha helix or a beta strand that is important for their function. They're not completely disordered. They're not completely random coil. So um, let's go back in history to the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. In those days, uh, there had been the Second World War. You know, in the Second World War, you have uh, jeeps and airplanes and tanks. They're all made of steel, right? And you have a steel structure that's very stable, very hard, and it's carrying out a special function. So the submarine has a special hard shape, and that helps it carry out its function. Or an airplane, a different shape and a different function. Now, the first proteins that were characterized in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they were like airplanes, tanks, and submarines. They had a very stable, hard structure. So you have proteins like myoglobin, ribonuclease, and lysozyme, and this structure helps the protein carry out, it's essential for the protein to carry out its function. So there was this idea in the post-Second World War generation that you need to have a hard structure to carry out the function. And that was even codified into a dogma, like, you know, be like, like a religion, a dogma, by Atkinson. <coughs> so he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1972 for saying that a protein's three-dimensional structure is determined uniquely by its sequence. And the structure is unique, stable, and, and kinetically accessible. So a protein has to have a hard structure that's determined by the sequence in order to have a particular function. Okay? That was the dogma up until the 80s and, and maybe the 90s. In the 1980s, two things started to happen. First of all, people were able to clone uh, proteins and express proteins. And people started finding that they could express proteins that weren't well folded, okay? But they, they, were, they were there. And there was also a development of something called the FPLC. So the fast protein liquid chromatography, they were able to purify them without these horrible ammonium sulfide fractionation and scuts. So, I think this is the first paper where they really um, describe the idea of what an intrinsically unfolded protein is doing. Okay, so in this paper in 1990, Pontius and Berg showed that an intrinsically disordered domain of a protein called HNRMPA1 can catalyze the renaturation of single-stranded DNA. So they took single-stranded DNA 
and they mixed it with this protein, and they found that you have double-stranded DNA that would rapidly be forming in the presence of the protein, but without the protein, the renaturation of the two single-stranded DNA strands is very slow. So look, in, in 1990, you can publish a PNAS paper with just gels. You know, it's fantastic. <laughs> um, but the gel is not the important thing of this paper. The important part of the paper comes in the conclusions. And this is where they really made a kind of a leap forward. They said, okay, how does this intrinsically disordered protein catalyze a reaction? And they said that, they, that this suggests that the protein is facilitating renaturation primarily by mediating frequent but transient associations between non-base paired strands. Okay, so they're saying that the intrinsically disordered proteins, they work like a meeting place or even a bar or a pub to facilitate interactions, transient, weak interactions. So this was a big step forward. It took 10 years before people really believed this idea. This paper was kind of forgotten, uh, but later, 10 years later, it was the idea was accepted. And now we know that IDP proteins are very important in regulatory networks, in transcription, translation, gene regulation, and they act to control uh, the, other, the other proteins. So if you remember the, the movie Matrix, right? Nemo is able to stop all the bullets. He's controlling the hard proteins. The IDPs work the same way. They control the enzymes and structural proteins because they're the ones uh, affecting regulation and transcription. So um, not just our proteins, but also viral proteins can take advantage of this effect. Mm -hmm. Viruses have many intrinsically disordered domains that manipulate our transcription and translation and degradation and regulatory processes to favor conditions that the viruses can use to grow better. So viruses are exploiting IDPs to hijack cells. <coughs> IDP proteins are also important in cancer. Uh, I'm sure you know that the protein P53 is important to prevent cancer because it scans the DNA and looks for DNA damage. When there's DNA damage, it can stall the transcription and induce repair, and if the DNA is highly damaged, it can even induce apoptosis. Uh, the P53 protein has a, an intrinsically disordered N-terminus and an intrinsically disordered C-terminus, and these dis in, uh, unfolded regions are interacting with dozens of proteins to carry out these effects. And if you have mutations in those regions, you can end up with cancer. Now, um, I want to mention that uh, it's still hard to study intrinsically disordered proteins because they're flexible and they don't have a well-defined structure. So you, you know, they're hard to purify. It's better now with, uh, with uh, FPLC. Um, but you have to be careful because they can, they can be degraded by proteases. Also, because they're <coughs> flexible, you can't really crystallize them. You know, if you do crystallize them, you might be crystallizing a certain conformation, but there might be other conformations also present. Uh, and also, they're not very good for electron cryomicroscopy because they're, they're usually too small. So, um, a better technique is NMR spectroscopy. With NMR spectroscopy, even in a half an hour, we can see if the protein is folded, like this would be a folded spectra with a very diverse, uh, separated amide region. We can see if it's unfolded. And if you do more complex NMR experiments, you can characterize to a high degree of uh, precision the conformation of the disordered domain, and you can detect small regions of structure. You can see if there's a po partially populated alpha helix or a, a, a beta strand that's present some of the time. Uh, any questions? <clears throat> Has to be the disordered one. So, um, if you think about the IDP proteins in conformational space, remember that Anthonson said that the folded protein is like in a deep energy well. Okay, so it's in the bottom of the well, so it's stable conformation and doesn't fluctuate very much. An intrinsically disordered protein 
can have different preferred conformations, and the interconversion between these uh, states is rather easy because the basins are shallow. It's easy to go from one energy basin to the next one. The minimum are shallow, and they can readily transform conformation. So we can think of the intrinsically disordered proteins as high entropy, high enthalpy uh, species. So they're up here on the top of an energy diagram. Okay, the folded protein is in an energy well, but we also have energy minimum called liquid for liquid proteins and for amyloids. Amyloids are very, very stable. Okay, so a folded protein has a hard time coming out of this energy well to become amyloid. It's in an energy well. But because the intrinsically disordered proteins are, are high energy species, they, they can tend to fall into this trap and become amyloid. They're, they have a tendency to form amyloid because they're not in a folded state. And um, if I could remind you uh, what the structure of amyloid uh, looks like, it's, remember it's a, it's a long beta strand, or a long beta sheet, with strands that are running um, anti-parallel to the dimension of the uh, axis of the fiber. And it's usually stabilized by hydrogen bond networks, both in the backbone of the protein, and if it has asparagine and glutamine, you can also have very stable hydrogen bonds forming in the side chains of the asparagine and glutamine, which also have amide groups. Um, uh, I don't know if we could take a, a, a brief excursion to outer space. Uh, <laughs> someone could tell me, what, what, what does this look like? Um, it's a black hole. Yeah, a black, a black hole. So I'd like to, um, <coughs> I'd like to pr propose an analogy between amyloids and black holes. Uh, in, the, in the protein folding field, there's this concept of, of, uh, of proteins going down an energy well to, to the folded state. <coughs> and this, this, this is a state we can characterize by liquid state NMR. The amyloid state is much, much more stable. And when it's formed, it's a bit like an event horizon. Once the protein goes into the amyloid state, it's so stable, it's very hard that it would go back outside the black hole. It's trapped inside. Also, for liquid state NMR, it becomes invisible. We can't characterize it anymore. Fortunately, you can characterize it by other techniques, namely X-ray crystallography, solid state NMR, or electron microscopy. Those techniques do let you see the structure of the amyloid. So I couldn't resist uh, showing you one slide of this fantastic paper that came out last summer on the tau uh, protein amyloid. They were able to isolate from a, a patient's uh, brain who had passed away paired helical filaments. This is a typical electron microscopy like when I was a student, we could do. Um, but now with the cryo-EM technology, you can get to atomic resolution or near atomic resolution, and they could solve the structure of the, of the amyloid fiber present in tau, which is contributing to Alzheimer's disease. Now, besides amyloids, these in, intrinsically disordered states can also form liquid phases. Um, so this is a discrete liquid phase that's not aqueous. It's not dissolved in water. It's like a liquid protein. And over the last, I guess, since, night, since 2007, when these were first described by Brandy Wine and co-workers, um, it's been known that there's several different kinds of liquid phases inside the cell. And these phases are different, and they don't mix with each other. One of them, called the nucleoli, is even composed of three layers of liquid proteins that are different, and they don't mix. And they act like an assembly uh, line to produce ribosomes. Um, the one that we're interested in is, is the stress granule. The stress granule seems to have two layers, a core and a shell. And in the stress granule, which is formed by proteins and RNA when the cell is stressed, you can have sometimes amyloid formation. So we're interested in how these stress granules form, if they could interact with other species, and how they could contribute to amyloid formation. Um, 
of the dozen of different liquid protein granules or micro droplets that are known, um, their functions aren't well known uh, in, in, in completely. Um, but it seems that all of them are, are involved in some way with RNA assembly, RNA uh, regulation, RNA transport. So the RNA, RNA component is also interesting to keep in mind. And um, so some of these IDP proteins, like, the, like a domain of FUS TLS, they form a liquid phase. And you can tell that they're liquids because these droplets fuse together, okay? They act like liquids. And you can also use a laser and you can photo blitz part of a droplet that's labeled with a fluorescent protein. And you can measure how long does it take diffusion to fill in the, the burned blitzed region. So you can see that if I, if I burn this half of the droplet over time, Molecules are diffusing through the droplet to make the other side fluoresce. And you can measure those kinetics of how long it takes for the, for the molecules to diffuse. And from the rate of diffusion, you can determine the viscosity. So you can measure the viscosity of these droplets. And it turns out to be about 100 or 1,000 times more viscous than water. So it's about as viscous as glycerol. But it's, but it's still a liquid. So, because they're concentrating proteins, the concentration can help amyloids form. So, in, in this example with, with FUS, you can see that the droplets first form, and then occasionally you have these fibers bursting out of the droplet, like it was a star or, or maybe a, a, a C-spine, and these are actually amyloid fibers. And in the case of FUS, they're known to be, uh, this process can be helped or accelerated by the presence of ALS-associated mutations. So um, uh, I wanted to make a pause here in case there would be any questions or if I'm talking too fast. And um, it's okay. And, and, and so we've seen a, a, a little bit about what the intrinsic proteins are, a little bit of history how they can be involved in the liquid phases and the amyloids. And now I'd like to um, turn to the next part of the talk, which is um, using the FUS TLS as a simpler model to look at aggregation linked to ALS. And then we'll have a look at TDP43, which is the most important protein um, uh, as a, you know, whose aggregates are present in almost all of the dying motor neurons of people who have ALS. And we want to ask, what is the structure of these aggregates and how do they form? Uh, it turns out that besides the C-terminal domain, which is intrinsically disordered, there's also a folded N-terminal domain that's involved in the physiology and also the pathology of the disease. And we want to see how these N-terminal domains can contribute to the aggregation processes by looking at their structure and how they might be involved in the assembly or disassembly of these aggregates. So um, uh, uh, you know more about this than I do, but um, let me just remind you that TDP43 is an essential protein that regulates splicing of RNA and also transports RNA to the cytoplasm. So it, it, uh, as you have shown here, it uh, can regulate its own gene. It can process many RNAs. It's involved in splicing and transcription regulation, and it transports <laughs> the RNA out to the cytoplasm. Now, when it's in the cytoplasm, in conditions of stress, it can associate to the stress granules. And this is probably where the harmful aggregation occurs, when it's um, you know, transiently bound to the stress granules. And this is where it can form these harmful aggregates that have been linked to ALS. Um, so the stress granules, um, even though they're a droplet, they have this irregular uh, shape as imaged by um, microscopy from the laboratory of Parker. Parker, uh, in a recent paper, used mass spectrometry to identify the proteins that are inside the stress granules. There's hundreds of proteins. Some of them are RNA helicases. There's protein chaperones. Proteins like TDP43 and, and, and FUS that are like RNA uh, shepherds or chaperones. And there's also thousands 
of messenger RNAs that get sequestered into the stress granules to inhibit translation while the cell is suffering some kind of stress. Um, the stress granules, they're not membrane bound. They're not a membrane bound vesicle, they're a membrane less vesicle. So they're a very dynamic structure, like a living structure. <clears throat> and they can be um, shaped by uh, ATP powered chaperones um, to refold the proteins or to change the structure of the RNAs. They are regulated by a special kind of RNA which seem to promote health. These RNAs are produced by the ribonuclease angiogenin, and it's known that angiogenin mutants are also linked to, R to ALS. So um, we'd like to have a look at these um, aggregates that are forming in the ALS disease. Um, and if you look at TDP43, it's disordered domain. This intrinsically disordered domain is complex. It has two regions that are rich in glycine. It has a hydrophobic segment. And it also has a segment that's rich in, in glutamine and asparagine. Okay? Now, on the other hand, FUS TLS has a disordered domain that has a simpler com com composition. It has a domain that's rich in glycines along with some tyrosines. And there's, there's actually several repeats of glycine serine, tyrosine, and then glycine serine. And FUS TLS forms these micro droplets that we saw in the previous slides. It can form a, a discrete liquid state. Am I talking too fast? Okay. okay, good. So we can use FUS TLS as a simpler system to start looking at the aggregation process and look and see what these aggregates could look like. So um, we can first see which kind of conditions promote liquid droplet formation. For FUS, it was shown, as you might expect, that higher protein con concentrations favor droplet formation. Also, lower temperatures and higher concentrations of salt favor the liquid state. So in this experiment, they're cooling the protein down, and if you have some salt, you see turbidity, okay? The more salt you have, the larger the temperature range where you see these droplets being formed. You can see this by, by looking at turbidity, or you can use a, a kind of microscopy that's good for looking at droplets called um, dark interference contrast. So, um, from my point of view, um, using NMR spectroscopy, we like that because it gives you a view of what's happening on the level of individual atoms or even atomic nuclei. So, the FUS domain was studied by nuclear magnetic resonance. This is a typical kind of spectra called an HSQC spectra, where you get nitrogen nuclei correlated to hydrogen nuclei. So for every amide hydrogen in the backbone, you get a peak. And you can assign the spectra and see what's happening to each NH group in the backbone. And you can perform experiments, uh, relaxation experiments, that tell you how flexible these groups are. So you can see their structure, and you can see how dynamic and flexible they are on a time scale of, of usually picoseconds to, to nanoseconds. And so this is the monomeric protein when it's not forming the liquid state. The monomeric protein is flexible and it doesn't have any structure. This is what these, these experiments are showing. Um, they also performed experiments on the liquid form of TDP, uh, of FUS TLS. And in the liquid state, uh, this group, which was leaded by uh, Fauzi, was able to show that in the liquid phase separate, separated state, the protein remains unfolded, and it also remains dynamic. It only becomes more viscous. So it still is disordered, even in this liquid state. To get more information on what the amyloid form looks like, um, it's possible to do that using solid-state NMR. So solid-state NMR, uh, they found that over time, the protein would form these fibrils. And they, they were able to show that this segment, shown in black, is the segment that's forming the amyloid. And let me show you how they, they were able to do that. Um, in solid-state NMR, you can do two kinds of experiments. 
One is called CP, is, is cross polarization, and this spectra detects rigid regions. There's another kind of spectra called a NEP, which is, um, I think, enhanced sensitivity by polarization transform, which reveals flexible regions. So by making labeled samples with carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 that were half labeled either in the C-terminus and another protein where it was just labeled in the N-terminus, they could show that the rigid region is in the N-terminus and the C region, the C-terminal region is flexible. It produces signals in the inept spectra. So they could identify right away that the amyloid is forming in the N-terminal part of the, of the domain. And then there's another series of experiments you can do with labeled protein where you look for distances between carbon atoms or between nitrogen atoms. And so if you know that there's a, a rigid region and if you can measure the distances between many different carbon atoms and many different nitrogen atoms, you can, with a computer, calculate a set of structures that are consistent with all those distances. And that's uh, what they were able to do. So this would be the structure of the FUS TLS amyloid solved by solid state NMR. And what they found that it's a, it's a beta, it, it's rich in beta strands that have many turns or, uh, you know, they're very sharp turns that we can call kinks. And so uh, here's like a beta strand, then a kink, a strand, and then a kink, more strands, then this kind of turn, and then another strand, another strand. And these, these are tyrosine residues that are, that are usually at the kinks in the, in the structure. Um, it's interesting to point out that this amyloid is very poor in hydrophobic residues. You probably know that A-beta that's implicated in Alzheimer's disease, A-beta is very hydrophobic. So A-beta can be stable because it has a lot of hydrophobic interactions. In the FUS TLS, the, the amyloid probably is less stable. It only has hydrogen bonds to contribute to its stability. And also, perhaps, um, the stacking of tyrosine aromatic uh, rings. Um, I want to mention that this, this paper that was published by McKnight and Tycho and their, and their co-workers has been recently confirmed by X-ray crystallography from the laboratory of Eisenberg. Um, Tycho's group also showed that many of these serines and threonines can be phosphorylated. And this phosphorylation charges up the amyloid. It charges up the amyloid, and this is causing the amyloid to break down. So in contrast to a pathological amyloid, you know, like A-beta, it probably has a functional role because its uh, formation can be regulated by phosphorylation. Um, so in, in uh, summarizing this part of the talk, um, We've seen that the FUS TLS, there's a 57 residue segment in the N terminal half of the domain that's forming the amyloid. So let's see if we can find out what's happening in TDP43, which has a glycine rich region, a hydrophobic segment, a, um, a glutamine asparagine rich region, and this glycine rich segment. So um, results obtained here in Trieste pointed to the guanamine, uh, glutamine asparagine rich region. Uh, uh, work published here showed that um, whereas the complete C-terminal region aggregates, if you remove the asparagine glutamine rich region, there won't be any aggregation. Or if you replace that with an alanine, a polyalanine segment, it also won't aggregate. And actually, if you make a construct with 12 repetitions of this um, glutamine asparagine rich region, that becomes a very good model for the molecular pathology. It, it, it readily uh, aggregates, and it can even sequester endogenous TDP43 into the aggregates. So um, we decided, uh, in collaboration with you, to investigate what would be the confirmation of this glutamine asparagine rich region. Why just 12? Um, I think there was a series of uh, constructs that were made, and I think even with four uh, repeats, there were some there was some power to to uh, form aggregates and and pull uh, the endogenous protein into the aggregate. But with twelve with twelve repetitions, the process becomes much more efficient. 
that probably has something to do with um, the cooperativity of the aggregation process. I'm going not A10 and something like that because they will have the job. In the in the clinic. So four works not very well. First work very well. What happens in the middle? So um, uh, in collaboration with you all here in Trieste, we started to characterize the structure of the guanine asparagine ridge segment using NMR spectroscopy. So um, you can measure spectra that reveal the nitrogen uh, atoms, the hydrogens, car the carbons, and you can carry out a process where you assign the peaks to the different residues, the different atoms, and from the frequencies of these signals, which we call chemical shifts, you can determine whether there is secondary structure present. So the, the frequencies of these signals, which are expressed as PPM, parts per million, they tell you whether there's alpha helix or beta sheet present. And from this analysis, we found that there is initially no structure. It starts out as a random coil. However, over time, this this peptide that starts out as a random coil, you can follow its conversion over several hours into a, a, a structure that has the red CD spectra. So this is using CD spectroscopy. You begin with the, the purple curve, which is a random coil, and over several hours it will transform into another spectra shown in red, which is a, has all the hallmarks of being a, a beta sheet. So we know this is a beta sheet, and we wanted to get more information about what the sh actual structure would be. So using uh, solid state NMR, we got a little bit of evidence for beta sheet structure. X-ray diffraction revealed reflections that are typical of amyloid. Using electron microscopy, um, also the typical dye bi binding experiments with uh, Congo red and th thioflavin T, we could see evidence for amyloid formation. And um, then we started to, to build up a computer model. Um, this would be like the hairpin, a beta hairpin model, which is consistent with the, with the experimental data. Um, and then using computers, we modeled um, different orientations. So the beta hairpins, they might go like this, or like this, or like that, or like that. So the most stable configuration is like this in parallel and together like this. And so you can use the, the simulations to build up larger and larger structures. This would be five beta strands, okay? And then from this, you can pack two, two monomers or, or two sets of uh, pentamers like this, or sorry, like that. And you get a stable um, double beta sheet. So this stable, this is a stable complex in the, in the simulation process. Uh, by le molecular dynamics, you can see that it won't uh, dissociate. It maintains its structure. And so this would be our model for what the structure of the TDP43 amyloid would look like. It hasn't been confirmed yet by experiment, but it's a reasonably good model. And it's interesting because it's a novel amyloid configuration. The, the, this kind of packing hadn't been seen before by, by other amyloids. So um, we can propose that the, one, the, the glutamine asparagine rich segment of the protein is forming amyloid. But we'd like to ask the question, are there any other segments that could be contributing to this process? Well, in, in 2006, a few years later, Song and co-workers in Singapore, they discovered that the hydrophobic segment which is conserved in evolution, can form, uh, it can form a partially populated helix. So using the, the chemical shift analysis, which looks at the frequencies of those signals, you can see that there's a, um, a disviation from the random coil values. And this is, this is uh, really a evidence that tells you that there's alpha helix there. Also, you can do an experiment called the hetero-NOE, 
which tells you how flexible or how rigid it is. And this is saying that this alpha helix is more rigid than the rest of the, of the domain. So it's forming alpha helix and it's rigid. Um, these results, which were originally obtained in Singapore, were then confirmed uh, in Brown University by Fauzi and co-workers. So they, they also assigned the C-terminal domain, and they found this evidence of alpha helix. They found um, evidence for uh, rigidness. And they also took another step forward, uh, because they showed that this C-terminal region can undergo liquid-liquid phase separation, like we saw for the case of Fuß TLS. And it's, the, it's, it's this alpha helix that's most important for uh, driving forward the process of the liquid-liquid phase separation. And they proposed that, um, that ALS mutants that disrupt the association could be um, important because it's somehow affecting the droplet formation. Just like Foos, they also found that cold temperatures and physiological salt or the presence of RNA can help form uh, the liquid separated phase. So um, together with, uh, with, with you here in Trieste, we wanted to ask a question. If the hydrophobic helix is driving or helping the liquid phase separation, is it enough to do so on its own? Can the hydrophobic segment form a liquid phase by itself? So, um, using the peptide produced by uh, Carado, uh, um, we tested for um, liquid micro droplet formation in aqueous solution, but we didn't see any liquid droplet formation. We added some salt, but it didn't form liquid droplets. We cooled it down to low temperature. These are all conditions that favor the proteins liquid droplet formation, but it didn't form liquid droplets. We added two different RNAs, and that didn't work. Um, you know, in the cell, inside the cell, there's a high concentration of macromolecules, and also metabolites. And these create a crowding effect that favor uh, associations. So we tried to mimic this by adding different crowding agents, like FICOL or polyethylene glycol, but n none, of, none of these worked. So. Um, these are unpublished data, um, but we can tentatively conclude that um, regions outside the hydrophobic segment are probably necessary for driving the liquid-liquid phase separation. Uh, it doesn't seem that the peptide on its own can do it. Um, uh, recently, there's been another advance from a group in Taiwan, the group of Huang and co-workers. They've used minogenesis to look at these hydrophobic residues, uh, like the tryptophanes. So it turns out that if you mutate the tryptophanes to glycine or alanine, you, you lose liquid-liquid uh, phase separation, even in the presence of favorable conditions like salt and cold temperature. And also, there's some other hydrophobic residues, uh, sorry, aromatic residues like tyrosine and phenylalanine that also <coughs> contribute to this, although they're not as important as tryptophane 334, which is in the alpha helix. So it seems like the aromatic residues are important for driving liquid-liquid phase separation. Um, <coughs> and it's interesting that these are often surrounded by serines or glycines, like has been seen in, in FUS TLS. So um, now we've seen that it seems like <coughs> maybe the QN-rich region forms amyloid but that might be helped by the hydrophobic helix, which is also need, it also needs segments outside those two regions in the glycine-rich region. So the whole C-terminal domain is helping to form um, the, the liquid phase separate, the amyloid. But besides these regions in the C-terminal disordered regions, it seems that the N-terminal domain is also important. So work obtained here in Trieste also um, uh, in many different parts of the world, showed that the N-terminal domain is also contributing to TDP43 physiology and also the pathology. Because they could show that if you delete the nuclear lo localization segment, the protein stays in the cytoplasm and aggregates. Okay, so you get this, this pathological effect. But if you delete both the nuclear localization segment and the N-terminal domain, 
you restore like the, the healthy response in, in, in transgenic mice. So this is saying that the N-terminal domain is contributing to the pathology okay, in this particular experiment. So these results started like a race to determine the structure of the N-terminal domain. So we kind of, uh, together with you and Christina, we kind of launched ourselves to try to uh, study the structure of the N-terminal domain. But we were, uh, we were scooped. <laughs> You know, like in the newspapers, when someone beats you to the story, that you're, you're scooped. So we were scooped by the group of uh, Song and co-workers in Singapore who published this structure in November of 2014. And I still remember finding this structure and you like, it's like to pull your hair out. <laughs> um, so what they had done, um, I should mention that the N-terminal domain um, it's not an easy protein to produce, so we really have to congratulate uh, you here for producing this domain. It has a high tendency to, to aggregate. It's not very, it's not especially stable. Um, and so in Singapore, they weren't able to measure very many NOE signals. These are the signals that you need to calculate the structure. They only were able to obtain 75. So what they did was they used a computer program which predicts protein structures. It's called uh, Rosetta. So if you give your sequence to Rosetta, Rosetta will tell you a thousand structures that could be the structure. It tells you a thousand possibilities. And what they did was they used their NMR data to select the Rosetta structure that must be right. Okay, what was the problem? The problem is that this domain is unique in, this, in, the beta, in the database. There's no structure like it in the database. So this kind of approach doesn't work very well. The Rosetta program told them the structure of the closest protein known, which was ubiquitin. Okay, so they, they published a structure that was similar to ubiquitin. Okay, it took us a little bit longer, but we were able to measure over a thousand NOE constraints and calculate an accurate structure, a more precise structure. And you can see here that they made a mistake. They put a beta strand where there's really a loop and there's a beta, a beta hairpin here where they put, they put a loop. So the ab initio methods can be very useful, but they have their limitations, especially when the structure you have is very different from anything in the da database. You know, so also we, we know that as the database grows, the ab initio method is going to be better and better. But in this case, it, was, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't right. And I wanted to show that uh, even in our case, we could also calculate not just the backbone structure, but also the position of the side chains. So we got a, we got a um, uh, uh, for NMR, a high resolution structure, not for X-ray, but for NMR, a, a, a good structure. And, um, so also in the literature, there's a lot of um, uh, data suggesting that the N-terminal domain can form dimers or other oligomers. And using another set of experiments, we could map the interaction uh, surface of that dimer. So um, in the N-terminal domain, you have a series of exposed hydrophobic residues, leucine 27, alanine 20, 33, proline 36, isoleucine 16, proline 19. And in our model, we could, we could show that these are forming a head-to-head -head dimer. These are exposed hydrophobic groups that are uh, oligomer dimerizing to form a dimer. But because of the solubility of the protein, it's very insoluble at pH 7. So we were working at pH 4. Okay, so we, we, were, we were able to this would be the structure of the, of the protein, and this would be the dimer interaction interface at pH 4. But, of course, what you would like to do would be to study the structure at pH 7 or 8, which is more physiologically relevant. So this is our result published last year in uh, July of 2017. And, and then we could use it to build up a structure. This would be the first structural model of the complete protein in a dimeric conformation. Uh, the gray region here is an is a, is a envelope from SACS, published by the group in Taiwan, and you can fit our uh, uh, domain into it. 
And then the C-terminal region, which is unstructured, would be oriented away. So we propose that the dimerization could help um, keep the C-terminal regions away from each other. That might help prevent uh, oligomerization. Now, um, just a few months after our paper, maybe one month after our paper, uh, there was another advance. By X-ray crystallography, the group of Paul and Mindyu solved the structure of the N-terminal domain, but now they did it at neutral pH, or at pH 8.5. Their interface includes most of the residues we found, but they also found an important interaction between glutamic acid residues and, an er and, a, and arginine residues. So at this higher pH, the, the, the glutamine residues will be negatively charged, and they can interact favorably with the arginines. And this expands the dimer interface. And instead of being head to head, it's now going to be head to tail. So the real, probably the real interface is head to tail. Um, but um, <coughs> with crystallography, there's a possibility that things might be different in solution. So, you know, the best thing would be to make a solution structure by NMR at neutral pH. And this was the next advance that was taken this year. So the group of Fauzi and Alaya, who also, I think, worked here some years ago, they took the next step forward. They made a mutant which was specially designed to stabilize the dimer and to pre prevent additional oligomerization. And with that mutant, um, they could confirm the structure of the head-to-tail dimerization configuration <laughs> that was proposed by Palimindiu. They also showed that most of the residues we originally saw are also present in the uh, interface, but there's also the uh, arginines and glutamates that were seen uh, by Palimindiu's group. And importantly, they also identified a serine, serine 48, as being um, a site for phosphorylization. So the N-terminal domain oligomerization, uh, which promotes this liquid-liquid phase separation, this can be controlled by phosphorylating the serine at 48. This would introduce a negative charge that would tend to separate the, the dimers. So um, if we could compare uh, these latest results uh, from our uh, collaboration, um, we found that the, at low pH, you have a head-to-head -head dimer, which is stabilized by hydrophobic residues. Okay, but at low pH, we're disrupting those attractive electrostatic interactions that would um, give rise to a larger interface, which was solved by the X-ray group headed by uh, Alain and Polymendio. Um, like us, they propose that the N-terminal domain acts to minimize the C-terminal region contacts. Um, Fauzi and Elias, their structure is similar to that solved by crystallography, and they also saw the uh, participation of the glutamates and arginines, um, but they proposed that their, their orientation of the C-terminal regions is different. They proposed that the dimerization would actually favor association of the C-terminal regions, and this would promote um, liquid-liquid phase separation. But this can, this can be controlled by phosphorylization of the serine 45. So um, at the moment, this is a very attractive result because uh, uh, with their results in hand, you can explain how the N-terminal domain promotes physiological association to liquid droplets, but how it could also prevent that by the phosphorylization of the serine 48. Um, no, so if I, I could have a, a one or two more minutes just to mention what could be future directions for this work. Um, at the beginning of the talk, we saw a paper by Pontius and Berg who discovered the, the, uh, this, the concept of disordered domains in a protein called HNRMP protein. And some years later, work from this, this laboratory showed that um, the same protein interacts with TDP43. And recently, this interaction has been characterized by NMR. So, you know, we start out by seeing the, the one segment of the disorder domain, then we've seen interactions in the whole uh, C-terminal domain, and then we've found that another domain of the TDP43 domain is pro important, 
And I think in the future, what will be important is to look at the interaction with other proteins. But uh, as you've but you've already you've already studied this here. It's interesting to point out that that Flausey's lab showed that it's the helical segment of TDP43 that's associating with the HNRMPA2. Um, and what's nice is that 10 years ago, by constructions, you showed that the same region is important. So it's always, it's always nice when two groups working with two different techniques get the same result. You know, that, um, that's promising. So in the future, it'll be important to look at more proteins to see what their effect on TDP43 aggregation can be, and probably also RNAs that could be present in the stress granule. So um, uh, just summarizing the, 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 the talk, um, I, uh, I, I mentioned that the C-terminal region is intrinsically disordered and forms these harmful aggregates in ALS. What's their structure? Um, at the moment, I would say that the, the structure would probably be the amyloid formed by the glutamine asparagine rich region. What's the next thing that needs to be done? Probably characterize um, a real physiological sample of a TDP4 to 3 aggregate and determine the structure of the amyloid present in those aggregates. For that, you would probably need solid state NMR or cryo micro, um, micro, uh, cryoelectron microscopy. How do they form? Maybe it's due to an excess time or lack of chaperone activity in the stress granules, interactions with other proteins or RNAs. Um, <coughs> we've seen that the TDP43 N terminal domain is essential for the physiological activity, but also the pathological aggregation. What's its structure? It has a novel fold with one alpha helix and two beta sheets. How does it contribute to physiology and to the pathology? From the, our results and also those of Pauli Mendius and uh, Fuelzi's lab, we've seen that they, it helps oligomerize to promote liquid-liquid phase separation, but the phosphorylization of the serine 48 could disfavor this process. So that's a, a regulation switch. What would be the future challenges? Characterize interactions with other proteins and RNAs and study the structure of aggregates from uh, real patient brains. And uh, Finally, I'd like to uh, thank uh, everyone who's participated in all these uh, works, especially Cristiana, Marco, um, Valentina, Corrado, Marco, <coughs> Manuele, Tito, Pesori. <laughs> uh, we, we were uh, really blessed in uh, Madrid with an uh, excellent uh, graduate student, Miguel Montellan, uh, David Pantoja is an expert in NMR spectroscopy. Uh, our collaborators in the Cajal Institute, uh, Avi Chakrabarti in Toronto, Anna McDermott in Columbia University, and finally, I'd like to thank the Spanish Ministry of Economy and Competitivity for support and also the European uh, Finance. Thank you very much. Thank you.